Welcome, River Run. It's good to be here with you today. You may be seated. So over the last few days, many of you probably, like me, gathered together with family and friends and ate some good food. We had, I, I think we had 12 people at our, at our house, and you know how it goes is you pull chairs from everywhere you can find them, you get a card table and put it together, and you try to figure out how do you gather everyone together. How many, if, if you, I took a poll in the last uh, group, we'll see if they had actually more than you, but how many had more? How many had 20 people or more at your house? All right, it gets to be complicated the more people you have. How about more than 20? Anybody have 30? Okay, how about more than 30? 35, how many did you have, ma'am? Okay, yeah, what did you have? A hundred. <laughs> okay, so, so there's a certain amount of complication, right, as you gather people together. Also, when you have 30 or more or a hundred, if, if we're honest, don't look at the person next to you, but there's some people you don't really like that show up at your house, right? And sometimes, and sometimes it creates some problems. And what we're going to look at today is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, the parable of the prodigal son. But oftentimes we skip the first few verses that set the context for that parable. In Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, I want you to see how this starts. The reason why Jesus tells these stories. Luke chapter 15, we're going to look at today. It says this, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him, meaning Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, now I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine you've got 20 or 30 people gathered in your home. Some of you that, that put the meal together realize how hard that was. As you have others together, everybody's ready, everyone's eating, and in the middle of that meal, there's laughing, right? There's stories. You always have someone at the table that loves to tell a funny story. You remember this and, and laughing. And it says Jesus was sitting and he's teaching. Imagine, even if they didn't understand who Jesus was fully, imagine the honor it was to have Jesus at their table. Jesus is sitting, he's talking, he's teaching. And he begins, he turns his head and he hears someone mutter. It says there's sinners, there's tax collectors and others, there's the religious elite, right, the Pharisees, and it says they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, have you ever had, uh, have you ever heard someone mutter at you? Right, think about it for a second. When someone mutters, what they do is they say something loud enough for others to hear, but soft enough when you stop and go, what was that you said? What do they say? Nothing. Nothing. And you heard them, right? But when you, but that's what a mutter is, right? It's like, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, now there's a lot that we could go into, even with just this setup. Ultimately, they're disrespecting Jesus. This man? Was Jesus just a man? We realize he's more than a man, but even for a common person, Jesus was a little more than a man. They realized he did miracles. It was an honor to have him there. So number one, they're disrespecting Jesus. Who else are they disrespecting? Really almost everyone else. But if we set that aside, if we set the, the negative mutter aside and we just say, what's the question they're asking or they're assuming in the mutter? They're saying, why did Jesus welcome sinners? Right? If we give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe they're unclear. They're asking the question, why does Jesus eat with sinners? Now, Jesus could have, have answered all kinds of ways, right? The way that you maybe answer those who mutter. But instead of directly calling them out, he probably could have called those mutterers sins out, right? You want to talk about eating with sinners? Let me tell you a few, right? But instead, he says, oh, let me tell you a couple stories. I imagine that everyone's eating. There's probably some intensity there. This man welcomes sinners, uh, the sinners who go, yeah, yeah, we're sinners. <laughs> we're just glad to be here. So I imagine Jesus standing up from the table and saying, hey, let me tell you a couple stories. And I think as we begin to unpack these stories, probably for some of you familiar ones, I believe that you'll learn some things about God, about yourself, and about those around you. 
There's three stories that Jesus begins to tell. The, two, the first two are kind of a setup. We're just going to explain them, and then we're going to go into detail on the third. The first two, Jesus says, Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? When they find it, joyfully puts on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors and says, rejoice, I found my sheep. You got it, right? He goes, come on, guys. Right? Imagine. There's tense, intensity kind of in that room. People are looking up. He tells a story. He says, hey, think about it, friends. If you had 100 sheep and you lost one, wouldn't you go after that one? Yeah, they're thinking, yeah, I guess we would. And then you'd rejoice and say, I found my sheep. He's like, yeah, hey, I got another one for you. And he says, the second one's kind of like that. He says, imagine a woman who has 10 silver coins, loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep, and search for it until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls, right, you see it. Say, imagine you lost this coin. Wouldn't you look at, wouldn't you look for it? When you found it, wouldn't you rejoice that you found it? And we think of coins, eh. But how many of you today, some of you were late probably coming in here to, because you lost your cell phone, right? Don't have to raise your hand. Don't give me the nod. Just, I know someone here. Or your keys, right? I, I've, had it, I've had it where I lost my phone and I'm like, call my wife. Hey, Susan, where's my phone? And she's like, you're calling me on it. And I'm like, oh, rejoice, I found my phone, right? You've been there. Jesus is just telling that story. He's sitting around with everybody. He says, oh, you want to know why you were sinners? Let me tell you a story about sheep. Let me tell you this story about a coin. And then he kind of zooms in a little more with this other story. It takes a little more time. He says, let me tell you about a story about two sons. Now, for this, um, as we explain this part of the story, I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need two sons to help me out. And I am in the Army as an officer, so a request is not a request, it's an order, right? So, so I need two people to help me out as my two sons. So, yeah, come on up. And we got, do we have someone else? I, do you think this would be my younger son or my older son? Probably older. Okay, so I've got an older son. Could someone come and be my younger son as well? I could also have a younger daughter if you'd like. Okay, come on, come on. All right, come on, son. All right, so, so now I've got my older son and I've got my younger son. And, and, and you know the story. Think about it, the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus zeroes in, he begins to tell the story. Here's what he says. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So you've got my sons. You guys are hardworking sons. And, and what they say is they say, you know, the younger son says, Dad, I'm tired. I'm tired of it all. What would it mean to, to come to your father and say, Dad, I divide my inheritance. I want it now. What does that mean? A nicer way of saying it would be, Dad, I wish you were dead. Right? <laughs> so Dad could say, Get down and do push-ups. Go back to work. You could do whatever else. But Jesus, I think, he's working the crowd. Think about it. They're all thinking, what's he going to say? So dad says, okay. I got everything. You want everything. This is my inheritance. I'll give you everything. We'll go. I'll give you half of everything I got, man. Here. Older son, I appreciate you. Now you take, please work doubly hard for your this younger son of mine, but I'm going to split my inheritance. So you can, I'll give it to you, son. So there's 20 for you. I'm keeping 20. Here's 10. Here's 10. How much more I got, son? One, two, three, four. And four. And you know what? I'll even get my change for you. I got 52 cents. Here's 26. And then he says, okay, I've divided my estate. And you know as well as I do, if you were really going to divide your estate, it would require some sacrifice. You'd have to liquidate property. There'd be a lot of other things that would take place, right? And then it's not even this where he says, okay, son, there's yours and here's yours. No. Father still got it. And he stands next to his older boy. He says, see you, son. You can go and have a seat. Just, up, just sit on the front row. And what we know is you've got this older son. Hey, son, I'm glad you're here. Just keep working. And 
and I want you to see the rest of the story as we come in. You've got dividing of the estate. You've got an older son who's working hard. You've got an, a younger son who's got, who's broke, probably broke not just up the family, but broke his father's heart. Jesus is telling the story like, what's going to happen next, man? And here's what he says. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, took all the money, set off for a distant country, and squandered all of his wealth and wild living. Spent it all. All of the inheritance. And then what do you do? What do you do when you hit rock bottom? You don't go home yet because you go, I'll be, I'll be a laughing stock, right? I mean, I've got some dignity. I'm not just going to go home. So you go look for a job. Now, how many of you know it's kind of hard to find a job if you're in a distant country with no money during a famine? So Jesus is telling this story. He's, he's, he's bringing them in. They're going, what's he going to do? And I think Jesus finds the worst job he can possibly think of. It's like dirty jobs 2.0 or something, right? Old te- uh, New Testament edition. So he goes, he looks at this and he says, you know what? He's a Jewish boy. He's working for a pig farmer. He's telling the story, pig farmer. And then he kind of says, you know what? The crowd's looking in, what? As they're eating their food, right? Pig farmer. No, I got it better. He's not just going to work for a pig farmer. He's feeding the pigs. He's working for the pigs. Yeah, right? And then he says, oh, no, I got it better. I got it better. He's not just feeding pigs. He is so hungry he wants to eat the pig food. That's what it says. Now, what happens when you get that low? Then you say, even my father's slaves got it better than me. And he begins to come home. But before, we're going to take a pause. How many of you think that you have had the worst job ever, right? Here, you, you go, how's the worst job? What's the worst job you've had? Concrete cutting and breaking. Concrete cutting and breaking. That's pretty bad. Anybody think you got a worse job than concrete cutting and breaking? Yeah, shoveling a hole. Shoveling a hole. With, okay. How about over here? <laughs> cleaning toilets on a Navy ship. That's pretty bad. <laughs> All right, so anybody worse than cleaning toilets on a Navy ship? All right, so if we're to break in concrete, cleaning toilets on a Navy ship, which one you vote for? Toilets? Okay. So Jesus begins to say, hey, it doesn't get much worse than this. The younger son comes home. Come on home. Now, now here's the thing. When he comes home, he comes up with this story, right? Because you've got to have a story, a speech. You can't just come home. What's dad going to say? So his speech, he says this. He says, Father, he's writing it down. He's walking home. Father, I've sinned against heaven and sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's got that in his mind going and going and going. And as he comes up, it says the father runs to him and hugs him and says, my son, you're home. And he starts to to give the little speech. You got it, remember? Father, I've sinned against heaven. Stop! I don't want you to be my slave. You're my son. Don't forget it. Servant. Right? The servant who's always worked. Not the son, the servant. Come on. Get the robe. Get the ring. Put sandals on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. Let's celebrate, right? I mean, you got it. You're there. I think at this point, everyone stopped eating and they're listening to Jesus' story. Uh Uh-oh, what's going on? He tells a story. And son, what's interesting is son probably wishes he came, could come back with half the inheritance. But guess what? Where's the, ha- where's the inheritance? It's gone. There's nothing you bring back but his so- sorry excuse. And father says, I don't even want it. I'm glad you're here. Let's have a party. Now, you, you can go back. Thank you. Thank you. And then, but now we got this son, right, that's working. And working and working. Now let's look here. In, he's still working. He's out in the field working. Son, younger sons come home, celebrating. Now look here. It says this. You're still working. You're still working. And, <laughs> and it, says, it says this. It says, it says man, isn't he a great son? Isn't he a great son? So, all right. Meanwhile, here's what it says. Um, it says, meanwhile, the older son is in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. He's going, never heard that before. Think about if you're with the story, if you're in the story. If you broke the father's heart, imagine how it's going to be being the older son that's picking up the pieces. There's been no party. Ain't no sunshine since he's gone, right? I mean, you got it. He's working. He's trying to cheer up dad. He's trying to do the work. He's doing double the work. 
for half the pay, right? I mean, he's got nothing. What's going on? There's been no sunshine. Now he's here and celebrate good times. Come on. Coming from his house. He's like, cool and the gang is over there. And now, so then what it says is that he, he went and he said, hey, what's going on? Right? You're saying, what's going on over there? What's going on over there? Right? And he says, hey, your brother's back. You think he's happy or sad? He's mad. He's mad. Oh, first he's like, what dad's going to do? But he hears celebration. And how many of you know that when you've been wronged, you can conjure up like the worst possible that's going on? They're probably having some drunken party without me, right? They're, they've got Ku and the gang and Trans-Siberian Orchestra there playing. And, and, and where's he getting the money for it? My inheritance, right? I mean, you're feeling me. And what's he saying? Who's paying for all this? Right. Who is? We know who is. Brother. <laughs> so here we go. It says music and dancing. Even this, the term music and dancing comes from the, where we get the word symphony. There's something going on. It's different. They hear it. And here's what he says. Your, um, so he called one of his servants. He said, your brother's come. And he's killed, killed the fattened calf. Older brother says, says, he became angry, refused to go in. So he refused to go in. So what's the father do? Goes out and says, hey, come on. Your brother's here. What does he say? Let me tell you the speech. Here it is. He says this. Look. All these years I've been slaving for you. You can see it, can't you? Right? What's he do? All these years I've been slaving for you. And look. But when this son of yours, it's not even my brother. Right? I got nothing. Right? When he's come, you haven't given me anything. And then the father says this. My son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate. And be glad because this brother of yours is dead and is alive again. He's lost and he's found. The end. How many of you get to the end of like a show and it's to be continued? And you're like, no! Right? Cursed the TV gods or something. It's like, what happens next? Jesus goes back to eating. Because it's not really about these two sons, is it? Thank you. You're welcome. It's not. It's about who? Those mutterers. It's not just about the mutterers, though, is it? It's about you and I, yeah? It's about everyone who's fellowshipping with Jesus. And you remember the question, don't you? He answers the question through these three stories. The question was, why does Jesus eat with sinners? Think about the story. What's the answer? Because he loves them. There's, you've heard the term prodigal, right? Oftentimes prodigal is used of the son. Here's what's interesting. The term prodigal in a negative term means reckless, wasting it all. So in the context, it would be talking about the inheritance. He wasted it all. But what about if prodigal in a positive term was talking about God's love, the prodigal love, reckless, giving it all. Think about when the father, how could the father spring to action so quickly? He could have been going to the bathroom. He could have been doing work. Why could he see his son at a distance and run to his son? Because he's been waiting since the day he left. Because he's been looking. He's been searching. Not a day went by. They didn't wish for his son to come down that road, right? I mean, that's the story. Why does Jesus see with sinners? Because he loves them. What's interesting even about those who mutter is they're sinners too, aren't they? Yeah. Right? Think about, we, we, we look at this passage when it comes to uh, around Christmas time. The word became flesh, right? The beginning was the word in John. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
this man welcomes sinners. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we celebrate. And he sits down and he eats with them. And he sits down and he does what? Fellowships with us. Now, the other thing that's interesting, if you, the irony of this story is this. The brother on the inside is the one who's left on the outside. The brother who's on the inside is now on the outside. The brother who's on the outside is where? Inside. It, it's like in, in the Bible when Jesus says, the first will be last, the last will be first. You go, what? That doesn't make sense. And you know why it doesn't make sense? Because the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of this earth. Think about it, friends. Jesus unlocks it in this story. He says, it's not about how good you are. It's about whose you are. Right? It's not about your sweat and how hard you work. It's about your blood and who you are. And no matter how hard you work as a slave, listen, let's pause. Look at the two stories because I guarantee you, you've come up with your same little uh, prayer that you're going to give to God. God, if you'll just forgive me, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not even worthy to be called your son, God. Make me a servant. And you'll see the father come and say, you're never a servant. You're my son. You're my child. Right? Slave, think of the speech of the older brother because we've done, prayed that one too, haven't we? All these years I've been slaving for you. I've been slaving for you and you don't even care. Father says, really, man? Really? Everything I have is yours. You don't even love your brother anymore. You don't even love me anymore. The truth of this story, friends, the truth for us is that we've never been meant to be slaves. We've always, you've been made to be a son. Sin is not the truest thing about you. Think about it. In the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he created us. He said, it's good. And he created us what? In whose image? Oh, when you look in the mirror, you look, you look just like your father. Is your worth and value in how good you are or in what you've done? Is your worth and value in all that you've done, the work, even your job, right? What's the first thing we say? Hey, what do you do for a living? Or is it in whose you are? You're not a slave. You're a son. One of my favorite quotes is by a guy named Brendan Manning. He says this. He says, God loves you just the way you are, not the way you should be, because you'll never be the way you should be. Now, that kind of rocked me at first. Brendan Manning is a, was a Catholic priest and a monk who left the church because of this work. I just have to work harder. And became a bum, a drunk and a bum, until he was, came face to face with the love of God and said there's something more. It's not about earning, it's about being. He says another quote in his book, Ragamuffin Gospel, he says, I can more easily contain Niagara Falls in a teacup then understand the reckless, extravagant love of God. And I think that's true. I think Jesus is trying to explain that to those who are eating with him. I think he's trying to explain that to us today. Now, I was preaching, uh, I used that quote in a sermon I preached to basic training soldiers. The, it's a reception station at Fort Jackson. It was a year or so ago. And the sermon was good. It was probably better than today's sermon. And, and when you're done with the sermon, I was like, it's done. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm ready to do a dance in the end zone and walk away. And this female soldier sitting about in the middle, she holds up her hand. And she begins to do this. And I'm like, didn't anyone tell her you're not supposed to raise your hand and ask questions at the end of my sermon? But I stopped. I said, yeah, you. Oh, who, me? Yeah, yeah the only one here raising your hand like this, right? And she stands up and she says, yeah, chaplain, but if that's true, who's going to hell then? 
If that's true, if it's true that God loves us no matter what, if it's true that I don't have to earn it, who's going to hell then? I said, I only got a couple minutes. (laughs) I said, but here's what I do know. I said, what I do know is this, that God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But he gives them a choice whether they want to come home or not. I said, just like in that story, I said, he runs to the, the son who comes regardless of what he's done. And just like the older son, he runs out to the older son regardless of all he's done. And he said, sons, let's gather together and celebrate. You are not a slave. You're my sons. And until you understand that, you don't know me at all. Jesus, they didn't understand it at that meal as Jesus told that story. But we see after the cross and resurrection, don't we? And we see Jesus standing as the father with his arms wide saying, I am the fatted calf. I'm not just giving you part of my inheritance. I'm giving it all to you. Right? No, this is even hokey. You don't even divide your inheritance. You have to die to forget the inheritance. And what's Jesus ultimately saying? I, this, this is what Father's like. You don't get it, but I, I come from heaven to earth to die for you. Because of my prodigal love for you. Reckless, extravagant. The world would look and say, ah, it's not worth it. And Jesus would say, it absolutely is. The father comes and pleads with the sons. And here's what he pleads, and here's what I plead with you today. That you would change your speeches into a song. That you'd stop saying, ah, I'm so unworthy, God, make me your slave. Or I'm so good, God, give me something for my goodness. And you change your speech to a song. And my prayer is that you would stand and you would sing, I'm no longer a slave, but I'm a child of God. Let's pray. God, we don't always understand your love. But God, we thank you for it. God, we are always unworthy. But we thank you that you call us your children. God, when we feel so far away, help us to run home. God, make a difference in our life. Let us start today. (laughs) Thank you, God, for all you do for who you are. Thank you for the story of a God who loves us more than life itself. We're no longer slaves, but we're children of God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.